about what's happening with the criminal charges being dropped. But that will be dealt with in a town hall meeting on tomorrow here in this same building at 6.30 p.m. So if you really have questions regarding the criminal cases and what their plan is and moving forward, please plan to be here tomorrow for their meeting. This meeting is about our civil litigation that the Flint class action team the cases we have in state court, the cases we have in federal court, uh, against the governor, the former governor, the state of Michigan, the DEQ, the cases against the EPA, all kind of bad actors. Yeah. All kinds of bad actors from all different areas of government. All positions where they should have been protecting us, yeah. where they should have been serving us, but they really just forgot about us. Because if they would have been thinking anything about us, we would not be where we are today. So the first thing I want to do is introduce our panel. My name is Attorney Trishelle Young. I am from Flint, born and raised. So I am not just an attorney on this case. I'm someone that has lived through this man-made catastrophe with you. I'm someone whose kids were exposed just like yours. So I'm not just talking, I know what you're going through, but I'm here to tell you there is hope. We are Flint strong, we are fighting. We have been fighting since 2015 and we have not stopped. So we don't want you to get discouraged for lack of a better term because of what's happening on the criminal side. Because we have some good news to share with you about what's going on on the civil side. So today we have a panel of attorneys, and starting here to my left, we have attorney Michael Pitt, and seated next to attorney Michael Pitt is attorney Ted Leopold from Cohen Milstein. Seated to my right, we have attorney Kristen Totten from the ACLU. And then we also have several members of our May's Dream Team that is here with us supporting us at the town hall and also ready to address any questions or concerns that you may have. And as I call your name, please stand so that people can recognize who you are. We have attorney Cynthia Lindsay. <laughs> attorney Teresa Bingman. <laughs> attorney Julie Hurwitz. Attorney Bill Goodman. <laughs> Attorney Paul Novak. <laughs> Let me see, did I miss anybody? We also have Attorney Greg, I don't want to say your name, Greg, Stamopotinopoulos. <laughs> 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 we have Attorney Charmaine Seeley. <laughs> and who else do we have? <laughs> just uh, came from the NRDC. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney, Attorney Kerry McGee. Yeah. Attorney Peggy Pitt. Yeah. So as you can see, we have a lot of attorneys on our team. Mm -hmm. Attorney Beth Rivers, is Beth here? Oh, stand up, Beth. Who? Mm -hmm. cool. We caught her already. Yeah. Attorney Esther Berezovsky. Yeah. Emily, 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 say hi, Emily. There, Emily, where's Emily? <laughs> she looks like it. <laughs> and we have Attorney uh, Taylor, who runs our Flint office. Stand up, Taylor and Ray. Uh, I'm sorry. Not attorney yet. Not yet. She on her way, though. Not yet. <laughs> So, but we really just wanted to show you that we are collaborating with attorneys who have expertise from different areas 
and, and we're strong on our cases and on our claims in the court. So we, we want you to see that we're still together. And, and I told you two years ago, actually 2020 now, Hall, that we had a dream team. And that team has So we are in great hands with the team that you have and that you see before you. So I'm going to get right into kind of reminding people how we got where we are. Because this didn't really start from the April 25th 2014 switch date. It really started from the imposition of an emergency manager because they usurped all of our voices, all of our votes, and all of our authority when they placed an emergency manager here in the city of Flint. And that one person made all the decisions that affected all of us. So in March 2013, the emergency manager announced that we were leaving the Detroit water system to go to the KWA. And that's the Karagandi Water Authority. You guys remember when they did that? Yeah. And so in April of 2013, the city of Detroit gave the city of Flint notice that they were going to turn off their water supply one year from that date. So as of April 2014, we would no longer be receiving water from Detroit. Now remember, Detroit, Detroit got their water from Lake Huron. They treated it in Detroit and then shipped it down here to Flint. That was lake water. Now, the KWA was not expected to be built until 2016, and that was being optimistic. So there was a clear two-year gap between the time that we were going to be cut off from Detroit and the time that the KWA was going to be ready to use. And in their infinite wisdom, the emergency manager, through the governor, decided to utilize the Flint River. We knew from the back, if you're from Flint, you knew off the bat that that was not you knew from the history of General Motors and all of the pollution that has gone into that river, the bodies that have been found in that river. Fish can't even live in that water. So you knew in 2014 it was a bad idea, but they did it anyway. And as soon as they did it, the visible signs were there and they were clear. We started seeing the discoloration. We started experiencing the rashes. Some people experiences hair loss, you know, and some people really got violently sick from the switch. They also were starting to fail tests, the water quality test. Bacteria was showing up all over the place. And so within months, they, that positive test for the bacteria, the city decided, well, we'll just put more chlorine in the water. And so then they began to over chlorinate the water. I don't know if you remember, I'm sure you do, we had three boil advisories within a span of 22 days. And at that time, they were looking at the TTHMs, which is the total trihalomethanes. But they knew that the lead was increasing, and when they told us to boil our water, that basically concentrated the lead levels and increased our exposure to the lead. So even though they knew about the lead exposure and the lead increase, they didn't tell us. They were telling us, you're okay, you're all right, drink the water. So that water became our Kool-Aid, basically. So in the fall of 2014, they sent out, well, they found out about the TTHMs, but they didn't notify the public until January of 2015. And even when they notified the public, they said, if you have a compromised, a severely compromised immune system, or if you have an infant, or if you're elderly, that you should consult your doctor before drinking the water. Not don't drink the water, but only they should consult. Never mind the rest of us who are being exposed to all of these toxins and chemicals. And then the city began failing the EPA's water tests. And they failed those tests in May, August, and November in 2014 consecutively. We know in October 2014, General Motors got off the water because it was corroding their engines and their parts. So imagine what it was doing to us, what it was doing to our kids. And we know that from June of 2014 through December of 2014, there was extremely increase in the lead levels that the MDEQ knew about, but not revealed it to the public. They didn't warn us, they didn't tell us, but they took steps to cover it up. And that's what makes a lot of these bad actors so 
egregious, you know, a shock to the conscience. It's, it's why criminal charges are mandatory in this situation. So we also know in October of 2014 that the defendants discovered a possible connection between the water and Legionnaire's disease. They didn't warn us then. And we know that 12 people should not have lost their lives from Legionnaire's disease because of these bad actors. And throughout all of this, we were being told, it's okay, you're overreacting, you're exaggerating. And really, let's be clear, we're not here because those bad actors had an attack of good conscience. We're not here because they just decided to do the right thing. We're here because we spoke up. We're here because we spoke out. We're here because we protested. We protested at City Hall. We boarded buses and we protested in Lansing. We filled plastic bottles and containers of the water showing the public and the world the discoloration, the yellow, the brown, the orange. Some of it you could clearly see the particles still floating around in the water. And we said this came directly from our taps. You know, and it was only when the world started to see what was going on in Flint that the government decided to wake up. Yeah. That's when they decided to wake up. And in June of 2015, the community came together and I filed the only lawsuit in the city of Flint to stop the defense River as a source of water. But I filed that in June. In July, one month after that lawsuit was filed, the state issued a statement, and I don't know if you remember, but it was big front headlines, and the state said, relax. Do you anybody remember that? They said, relax, the water is to drink. And the entire time they were telling us, they were shipping bottled water to the state workers in the city of Flint, so they wouldn't have to drink the water. So it was, it's all kind of hypocrisy going on. And they really thought we would be expendable, but we're not. So we, we came here tonight because we want to update you. We want to educate you. We want to give you an opportunity to ask us questions, to get any questions that you have answered so that we can address any concerns. We have many, many people here that are going to talk about the resources that are going to be available for you. And again, the criminal questions should be directed at the town hall tomorrow, but civil questions, we're gonna answer every question you have tonight. And we want you to know that we are in court, we are at the table talking, we are fighting for you, we have been and we will continue that, to fight for justice, not only for you, but for all of us, for Flint, because Flint will rise, because we are Flint strong. Just to let you know, this town hall on by NBC 25 on Facebook. Uh, so if there are others who are watching this online, we do want to conduct this meeting in an orderly fashion. So please don't shout out, don't yell any questions that you may have. You will be recognized when you come to the mic. If you get a phone call or anything, please step out of the room so you don't disturb anyone else's ability to receive the communication that we have to share with you tonight. And with that, we're going to start with our first legal update from attorney Michael Pitt. Thank you, Tricel. Hey, everybody. Great to see you all again. We've been fighting this fight for almost three years. We started in November of 2015. We're coming up to the th th three year anniversary. Four, four, oh, excuse me, oh, my math is terrible. Four years, four years, four. So <clears throat> what have we been able to accomplish in three and a half years? The team that Trishel put together, the lawyers that you met here, have been working to make sure that all avenues of escape have been cut off so the state of Michigan is left with only two choices. Either they settle the case or they try it. Those are the only two choices they have. 
And let me give you sort of a rundown of what we had been doing for the people of Flint. This case was started in November of 2015. In April of 2016, Judge O'Mara, who had the case initially, dismissed the entire case. We were out of court. We appealed it to the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. The Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals said to us, we won, and they said to the state, you lose. Say it, you lose. Right. In, in October of 2016, the state of Michigan tried to have the case that we filed in the Court of Claims dismissed by Judge Boonstra. Judge Boonstra is a is a conservative judge, and Judge Boonstra wrote in his opinion, such conduct on the part of state actors, especially the allegedly intentional poisoning of the water users of Flint, if true, may be fairly characterized <clears throat> as so outrageous as to be truly conscience shocking. We won, they the state of Michigan appealed Judge Boonstra to the Michigan Court of Appeals. What do you think happened? They lost. In January of 2018, the Michigan Court of Appeals, another conservative group of judges, said <clears throat> various state actors intentionally concealed scientific data and made false assurances to the public regarding the safety of the Flint River, even after they had received information suggesting that the water supply directed to your homes was contaminated with Legionella and dangerously high levels of toxic lead. At the very least, plaintiff's allegations at the very least, plaintiff's allegations are sufficient to support a finding of deliberate indifference on the part of the government actor in this case. Plaintiffs have alleged sufficient facts to show a constitutional violation. We won, they lost. In January of 2019, Judge Levy, who found in your favor, her case was appealed to the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals a second time. A very conservative judge of the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals wrote an opinion that said, as with the Flint defendants, these state defendants created the Flint water environmental disaster and then intentionally attempted to cover up their grievous decisions. Their actions shock our conscience. It shocked the conscience of the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. We won. They lost. In April of 2019, Judge Levy was asked whether Governor Snyder belonged in the lawsuit. She said, when asked about Governor Snyder, the governor was indifferent because instead of mitigating or lessening the risk of harm caused by contaminated water, her words, not mine, he covered it up. In private, he worried about the need to return Flint to Detroit water and the political implications of the crisis. But in public, he denied all knowledge, despite being aware of the developing crisis. This is our former governor that a federal judge, what our federal judge is describing, the governor. As a result, plaintiffs, you folks, 
were lured into a false sense of security. Is that true? Were you lured into a false sense of security? Of course you were. They could have taken protective measures. If only they had known what the governor knew. If only you knew what Governor Snyder knew, you would have stopped drinking the damn water. <laughs> governor Snyder's administration even encouraged them to continue to drink and bathe in the water. Governor Snyder's actions were deliberately indifferent and exhibited a callous disregard for plaintiff's right to bodily integrity. Not my words, not Ted's words, but a federal judge has said that about your former governor. We won. You got it. We're suing the EPA. The EPA told Judge Parker they don't belong in court, that they didn't do anything wrong, that they should be dismissed from the case. And they filed a motion to dismiss their case. And Judge Parker said, the contamination which began in 2014 and continued for years as local and state officials provided inaccurate information about the safety and issues of city water, EPA officials knew residents were not being warned of the contamination. They knew it. These lies went on for months while the people of Flint continued to be poisoned and the EPA let it happen. Judge Parker would not let them out of the case. We won. All right. so I think you're getting the picture. We every challenge that we have been faced with. Every, every one of them. And so the state is now in a pickle. And the pickle can get these cases dismissed because what we did was wrong. Every judge who has looked at this case has agreed that the state was wrong. We are right and we are on the side of right. And the state has a choice. Settle the case or go to trial. If they go to trial, the consequences could be severe. And so my partner, Ted Leopold, will talk about what's happening in the, along the settlement front. But I just want to uh, comment about, about all you folks. I know you're all concerned about what Attorney General Nessel did in dismissing the, the cases. Now, I'm not making apologies or excuses for her. I want to tell you what the facts are. She inherited a tremendous mess, a first class mess that the prior administration, Governor Snyder and Bill Schuette created the mess. And how did they create the mess? They had the audacity to pay for both sides of that criminal case. They were paying Mr. Flood money to prosecute the case, and they were paying the attorneys for the people who were being prosecuted. The state was paying both sides of the case. So what do you think happens when somebody else is paying the legal bills? The litigation goes on forever. It's never going to come to an end. Dana Nessel inherited that mess. It was a, we, when we found out that this was going on, we complained bitterly to the governor and to the state to no avail. But they let that go on, that situation where the state of Michigan was paying for the prosecution and the defense. Those people who are guilty of, what, of those crimes, and there were crimes that were committed, committed, should not have had their attorney fees being paid by the state of Michigan, period. It should never have happened. It should never have happened. And if, and if they had done this right, those people would have pled guilty and they, some of them would already be in jail. But the prior administration messed up. They created this problem and now Dana Nessel was given the, the task 
to fix it. She did what she did. And it, you can say maybe she should have done it a different way, but she had to do something. So uh, I want to let you all know that when, uh, when Dana Nessel is here tomorrow, uh, you need to speak to her in a constructive way because each and every one of you, every one of you have a constitutional right as a victim. In our constitution, there's something called victim rights. And you have a right to know what the, what the state is doing in prosecuting the crimes that were committed against you. Every one of you had a crime committed against you. Every one of you had a crime committed against you. And you have the right to know what's going on in that prosecution and to confer with the prosecution. I suggest that you all get organized, talk to the governor in a constructive way, and say, we, you say you're, you're going to renew the prosecutions, good. We want to be informed, and we're going to, we're going to appoint leaders for you to talk to, get organized, and, and uh, make sure that Dana Nessel knows you're out there and assert your legal rights as a crime victim because you have a constitutional right to certain protections. Exercise. That's all I have to say. Now we will hear from Attorney Ted Leopold. Good evening. I am honored to stand here with and with all of you to talk to you about what we have been doing along the lines of trying to provide a full measure of justice to each and every one of you over the last several years. I am reminded as I look around and out here tonight and see your shirts that many of you are wearing that talk about Flint is still broken. Yeah. But I also hear in the same sentences, in the same voices, in the same words, with high volume, Flint Strong. Yeah. So, as I talk to you here for a moment, we can talk about how Flint is still broken with its pipes, with its water, with its illnesses, its sickness, bad water, but it was not, what is not broken is your spirit, your individualism, and making sure that what has happened to you will never happen again. So let me tell you about what we've been doing. Mike has told you about the past litigation and how we have won in every aspect of this litigation. And we won because justice always wins in the end. And we have won at all different levels of the court. And now, because the state has nowhere else to turn, there is a second avenue we are pursuing. And we are very, very fortunate to pursue in that avenue what is referred to as a settlement a potential settlement. Whether it happens or not, none of us have a crystal ball. But I can tell you that as part of a litigation on the other avenue is a settlement, to look to see if there are ways that can formulate a result for everybody. And we are only concerned about one win. That is the win for you and the citizens here in Flint. Because we have to remember Everybody in Flint was harmed. Everybody. And our goal is to make sure that everybody recovers as a result of a resolution in this case, whether by a jury verdict or by a settlement. So even though some may be hurt more than others, everybody, everybody, your neighbors, your cousins, your nephews, your children, the store owners, Everybody has to recover as well. And we are going to assure that as part of any settlement 
that everybody is treated equally with full and complete parity. There's not going to be one group over here and another group over here and whoever has a lawyer over here gets treated for a different lawyer than over here. There will be a full parity in any settlement that is discussed and in any courtroom where an action is tried. And to help us along those lines, we're fortunate because we have two what's referred to as mediators. They're like judges, but they help to try and get the matter resolved. One person, a mediator, is Pam Hardwood. And for those of you that don't know, Judge Hardwood is a retired judge who has worked in, throughout the state and in Detroit for many, many, many years and has been involved in many cases such as this. She's retired, so she tries to get the parties together. And I think one of the best things is that we group of lawyers is early on, we said to Pam Hardwood, we want you to have help because since we are involved with the state, we want somebody that has political gravitas, somebody that has very, very well respected. And so we asked Senator Carl Levin, who many of you know, over 30, 35 years in the U.S. Senator, is a mainstay throughout Michigan, has been involved in not only international issues and national issues, but also state issues and local issues. And he has great respect, not only of people here in the, in the city of Flint, but around the state, and most importantly in Lansing with all the politicians. Senator Levin is one of our mediators. You could take it to the bank. You could take it to the bank that if Senator Levin is working for you to try and get a full resolution, a full measure of justice, then you know that he's doing the right thing. And if he says that this is, at some point in time, a case that should be settled for a full measure of justice and there's complete parity and that everybody in Flint will recover, then that's good enough for me. And if he comes and tells us that one day, I'm going to feel very comfortable, Mike's going to feel very comfortable, and everybody is going to feel very comfortable who's been working on this for many years, that it's the right thing to do. So they're working very hard, very hard, to try and do that. And it's just not with the state. It's with all the other defendants, the private engineering defendants, who gave really bad professional advice to the city and to the state. And it's not just the private engineers, it's the EPA, and it's other individuals as well. So with all of them helping, we are working behind the scenes and pushing the litigation as much as we can, and on the same wheel that's spinning around and around, we're also working with the mediators who are working constantly to try and bring the parties together with the hopes that at some day we'll be able to try and get this matter resolved. It may not happen, and we may go to court, and we're confident if we go to court, we're going to litigate the case, and we're going to win the case. Yeah. Yeah. There's no doubt. But our goal, our goal, is to try and get this litigation over with as soon as possible, and provide justice for everybody as soon as possible, and to provide justice, an equal justice, for everybody within the city of Flint. So I can assure you that all of us on the legal side are working day in and day out to do that, okay? Now, when I came here tonight, they told me that besides being Flint strong, that there is a song that you all have adopted as well as the fight song, Rise Up. Is that, is that correct? Everybody aware, aware of that? And do you know, have you all ever focused on what the words to that song? There's a phrase in that song that says, when the silence isn't quiet and it feels like it's getting hard to breathe, and I know you feel like dying, but I promise we'll take the world to its feet and move the mountains. And that's what we are going to do. That's what we've been fighting to do. We will continue to do that, and we will never stop doing that until we move those mountains to provide justice for each and every one of you in the city of Flint.
they just told you that the state is down to two options. Either they go to trial or they settle. And I tell you what, if the state is crazy enough to take these cases to trial and put them in front of a jury, they would have to be crazy to do that. So without further ado, we're going to switch gears and talk about the ACLU's education case. And this is the lead attorney from the ACLU, Kristen Totten. Thank you so much. Thank you. You know, it was October 20, well, it was actually in 2015, and towards the end of the year, that I was pouring water into my kids' water bottles, and my kids are right there. Shout out to Jake and Grace. They're familiar with Flint. We've been trekking up here ever since February of 2016. Um, they enjoy coming up here, um, especially for your Coney dogs. So something we don't get so much of in Western Michigan. I'm from Kalamazoo. And when I was in my kitchen pouring their water bottles, I stopped for a minute and I thought of the mamas in Flint. I thought of the dads in Flint that trusted their government who said that the water was safe to drink. And they gave it to their children, they gave it to their babies, and they gave it to themselves. And I'm an attorney that specializes with kids with disabilities. And I had private practice at the time, and I said to myself, I really hope that I can do something. And I thank God that I was called by the ACLU of Michigan to get involved because we knew in the wake of the Flint water crisis, the burden that the babies were going to have to carry in their bodies was going to reinforce a racial stereotype if we didn't stop it. And if we didn't raise the awareness of this, these children are not bad. They are impulsive because of the lead and the neurotoxicity that has gotten into their brains and their bones and their tissues. And we need to do something to identify what their needs are. We approached the state under the Snyder administration. We didn't want to have to go to litigation. We thought they'd want to do the right thing, right? These are children for the love, right? Approach them and um, they said, well, we've supplied nurses to all the schools. And let me just tell you, they got the nurses quota up to what it should have been. Um, we were the worst in the nation, having one nurse for all of Flint Community Schools. They just got one in every school. Well, that's a good thing, but you should have, right? Children deserve to be healthy to go to school. And, we also, and they also said, well, we supplied them with leafy vegetables. Nutrition can ameliorate some of the lead-related issues, but we're talking about a school system that was already struggling to meet the needs of special education students and was going to be inundated with further kids that had struggles, right? Behavior-related disabilities so often are over-punished, over-disciplined, and pushed into the criminal justice system. We, I'm sure that we know of children that are being impacted in that way. Right? And I sat on Tuesday in the Genesee court and I watched the kids come in and it just renewed my fight inside of me because I saw kids coming in for probation violations. Why? Because they were suspended from school. Who's asking the question as to why they were suspended from school? Right? The impulsivity, the problems that they're struggling with, those ADHD related systems, those can be caused by lead. And that's not something people are talking about. So I'll get to my lawsuit. We did file it. We filed on behalf of 15 named plaintiffs who are class representatives. They are all students with disabilities that reside in the Flint Community School District. So they may go to charter schools, but if the Flint Community Schools was robust enough to meet their needs, they would have the opportunity to send their child there. Of course, the first thing that the state threw at us was a motion to dismiss, to get that case out of court. Usually with special education litigation, we filed it under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. It is an entitlement statute. It means that children are entitled to a free, appropriate public education. And what is appropriate is determined 
We need to identify what their needs are so we can conform the system to them and what they need rather than making them conform to our system and making them fit, right? I've seen children that have autism but are being di diagnosed as, as um, cognitively impaired here in Flint because it's cheaper to dump them in a CI classroom than it is to have an autism specialist on staff to really provide those targeted interventions. This is horrific that this is happening. And thankfully the world is watching. So with this motion to dismiss, thank God the judge, we have Judge Art Tarno of the Eastern District, and he said, no, we're not gonna throw this case out. So we won on that. And the beauty of it is, is that the state was trying to throw what the narratives are that I've seen when I represent families with children with disabilities. What do they do? They blame the family. They blame the parents. Well, if they just disciplined them better, or if they didn't overindulge them, right? If they did that, you know what really makes me mad? They're reinstituting a cycle of abuse in the home. They're doing it at school, and if they're saying, well, just go home and discipline your kid better, and you don't know what resources you have to really deal with a child that's having extended anxiety and other related issues, then we're harming children in the places they're supposed to feel the safest, right? So the Attorney General's office tried to argue that, you know, they come from poverty, there could be homes that have drugs. And I stood up and I said, your Honor, this is a disability that has been inflicted upon the children of Flint, and we have to make sure that they get what they are rightfully entitled to. And that was an exciting moment, but I'm not, the ACLU is not doing this alone. We also have the Education Law Center out of New Jersey, which is known nationally in regards to bringing school cases, and we also have the White & Case Law Firm out of New York, a law firm that has over 3,000 attorneys and it's an international presence. So we're very, very thankful that we could not have taken on the state and we sued the Michigan Department of Education, the Genesee Intermediate School District, and the Flint Community Schools because they are on the ground level. So as we filed the motion to dismiss, we survived that. That was back in, oh dear, that was back in 2017. Then we were really concerned because special education can take, cases can take a long time, right? I didn't want to see these kids that I was representing in kindergarten get to high school and not get the relief that they were rightfully entitled to, right? I did not want the kids that I represent to go into the criminal justice system and the people be ignorant as to how they're punishing disability-related behaviors. So we filed a preliminary injunction. What that means is it's a really quick trial to get some immediate relief. And that preliminary injunction was, we want universal screenings for all the kids. Because you see what the state did, in October 20, oh time, shoot. Okay, really quick. <laughs> October of 2015, when the governor finally acquiesced and said, okay, it is a problem and he wasn't gonna test the waters in the schools and the public pressure, God bless all of you that really applied the pressure, we want our schools tested. It showed record numbers, high numbers, some at 2,000 parts per billion in, in Durant Terry Mott. Those kiddos and those teachers and that stuff, they were drinking that when they thought it was safe. So we said, we need all screening to be done to the schools, in the schools. And the, the, the Board of Education for the Michigan Department of Education said, well, open up all the schools in Flint, have the children come through, let's get organized, work with the local health system in order to do that. You know when they did it? January of 2016, right? Some of you may have taken your children there or your grandchildren there. It's not in the blood anymore if they stop drinking. It's only in the blood for 20 to 30 days. They knew that. They knew that when they delayed it. So we said we need to have neuropsychological testing for every child in Flint. We need it available because see, that lead is not in their blood anymore. It's settled in their brains, yeah. right? Time, time. So excellence, get your children evaluated because the state had to pay $4.1 million 
in order to establish that here. It's attached to the Autism Center, but it's separate from it. It's a brand new organization that we're working closely with the registry um, and also with MCE. You can do a direct referral. Teachers can refer. Parents can just say, I'm concerned about my child. Get them evaluated. We need to inundate them to make sure that they stay sustainable and we get the, te the kids what they need. Thank you, Kristen. And our final attorney legal update is going to be from the NRDC, and it's attorney Jeremy Orr. Good evening. Uh, so I'm here on behalf of Natural Resources Defense Council. Uh, we're an international uh, environmental organization that does uh, environmental uh, law and policy work uh, around the country and around the world. Uh, I represent our Safe Water Initiative, which is uh, a team of attorneys and, and policy folks who do uh, clean water, uh, affordable water, uh, litigation and policy work around the country. But I'm also a Detroit resident, so uh, working on that team, uh, you know, being able to work on, on Flint uh, and Detroit issues really hit close to home for me. So I'll give a quick kind of rundown of, of the case that we're working on, which is a lead pipe replacement case, uh, for those that you know, many of you are familiar with. Uh, and you know, be happy to answer any questions afterwards. So in October uh, 2015, uh, we uh, filed what's called an, an intent to sue. Uh, umpire. So in October 2015, we filed an intent to sue, letting the state and the city know that we'd be filing a Safe Water Act lawsuit to replace the lead service lines um, you know, in the city of Flint. Uh, around January 2017, that lawsuit was formally filed uh, in collaboration with uh, ACLU of Michigan, our co-counsel on this case in representation of uh, you know, clients here located in Michigan. Uh, after um, about a year, eh, maybe about eight months of going back and forth preparing for trial, uh, the city uh, and the state finally came and said, okay, let's, let's talk about settlement. So as, as Mike mentioned, you're either settling or you're going to trial. The state wanted to settle, right? And after about three months of hardcore, uh, hardcore negotiations, we settled on uh, what ended up being uh, the agreement that's replacing lead service lines that you all have seen today. So that settlement terms consisted of $97 million for lead service line replacement, $57 million coming from the state, $40 million coming from the federal government. Of that money, that money would go towards lead service line replacement within three years. Uh, and we're in the third year right now in 2019. It began in 2017. Uh, and it also took, uh, it also funded a filter program. So those of you who have received filters, if you signed up for a new account, uh, or you had your pipes replaced and you needed a filter following it. Uh, so that money covered that as well. Uh, and that program went pretty well throughout 2017. Uh, they had uh, the, the excavations that were taking place, the pipes that were being dug up and replaced. Uh, there was a hit rate of about 80%. So about 80% of the lines that were dug up uh, you know, they were led and they were being replaced. We noticed around the end of 2018 uh, that that hit rate had dropped. Right, that hit rate dropped from almost between 10 and 15 percent for the year of 2018. So essentially, what was happening was lead service lines weren't being dug up. Copper service lines were being dug up and reburied. Once this was brought to our attention, we went back to the federal court uh, to file uh, an amendment, uh, an amendment to our stipulation of the settlement. Right, saying that we need to go back, first we need to go back to the model that was successful in 2017 that, was re that had a hit rate of replacing lead uh, service lines at 80%. Uh, they also needed to do a better job of prioritizing the areas where we pretty much knew lead service lines were as opposed to going to places randomly digging up copper lines and reburying them. So using a specific model to determine where these lead service lines were, going to those homes first, prioritizing them, uh, and making sure that their pipes were replaced immediately. Also, as part of this uh, amended agreement, it required the, the city to report back on these numbers with us regularly, uh, report back on the use of those funds, uh, and it requires a conference as this year winds down, this is the last year of service line replacement as mentioned, as it winds down to have a conference to make sure that that money was spent adequately uh, towards land service line replacement uh, and any discrepancies that came up we could address uh, using the force of the law. And that's where we are now. So uh, as I mentioned, we went back to court this year, uh, filed and agreed upon in February, and since then we're already back up to a 60% hit rate on replacing lead service lines. So up from 10% last year, 
up to 60% this year, and that number is continuing to rise. Uh, as well, uh, the city has hired a, uh, uh, um, a project manager to help coordinate the lead service line replacements. If you all have noticed, right, maybe the beginning of the year when the weather was bad, you probably didn't see as many, but now you should be seeing way more lead service lines being replaced in your neighborhoods. Um, yep, so that's, you know, that's, that's one thing that, that's going to be critical to pay attention to, um, you know, as, as we look to see who's on those lists uh, and where those numbers are going to be prioritized. Um, and as well, so that agreement that was agreed upon a couple of years ago dealt with uh, 18,000 um, service lines being, 18, being excavated, which is dug up. Uh, as of June 2019, there are 22,000 uh, lines that have been dug up of the 28,000 estimated that needs to be dug up. Uh, almost 9,000 service lines have been replaced. Um, and as part of that, this final year, there are about 7,000 left prioritizing in two groups, 4,500 and 3,500. So 4,500 will be hit, followed by, based on that, that new criteria that we talked about for hitting lead service lines, followed by the remaining 3,500. Uh, and this is, you know, this is just an update. Uh, and on behalf of NRDC and, and, and our, our co-counsels at ACLU, we know, right, that, that no amount of money and, and no amount of lead service lines being replaced uh, can begin to, to, to redo or reverse the harm done here to the people of Flint, right? But we know that it's a start, uh, and we're going to continue to fight for, for full justice and making you all whole as we continue this battle. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Orr. So you can see the collaboration that's been going on from all the harm that was done to the residents in the city of Flint was truly tremendous. And so it needed to be attacked from multiple angles, and that's what was done, and that's what continues to carry on in these cases. Raise your hand if you ever protested when the water was switched. Look around. These are the people who started this. Raise your hand if your pipes have been replaced. Raise your hand if your lawn was tore up when they replaced your pipes. Hold on, hold on. Well, some good news we just heard is that the city council just passed a resolution so they can come and fix the lawns that they tore up from replacing the pipes. So right now we're going to transition and we're going to ask our second panel to come forward. And while they're doing that, we're going to have a little music while they switch seats. making her way. We have Dr. Fur Holden and Attorney Cynthia. Here we go. Yep, I'm 
Anybody want to stand up and do some calisthenics? <laughs> uh, good afternoon. I usually don't have to have a mic because I've never been told that I talk quietly, but I'm going to use it to make sure everybody hears me. My name is Attorney Cynthia M. Lindsay. I'm here to stand before you. I'm privileged to be here with you. Many of you know me. I've walked with you. I've marched with you. I've ridden the bus over to Lansing with you. I've campaigned with you, and I will continue to do that. Now, I was an attorney living in Detroit. I still live in Detroit, partly, uh, for over 34 years. And I decided after 34 years, it was time to retire. So me and my husband moved down to Florida, not too far from Ted, uh, and we went down to retire. And what did I hear in the news while I'm down there? They poisoned Flint. I'm like, what? Poison Flint? Well, immediately, I said, OK. It's time to try Hey, wait a minute. Get ready now. You know, we take off our earrings and get some Vaseline. And you know why? Because I grew up in Flint from the time I was 16 years old, 50 years ago. You can do the math. I grew up at 1309 and 1405 Lippincott over near Dort Highway with my adoptive family, the Verdun family. So anything you know about me, don't mess with my family and don't mess with my friends. So when they said that, retirement had to go on the back burner, I'm back. I decided I was going to come fight for Flint, but I knew I couldn't do it by myself because I knew the defendants were going to fight us. So I called my buddy, Teresa Bingman. I said, Teresa, she called Shermaine Seeley. Where's Shermaine? She called Shermaine, and we were ready to do battle. But again, we're fighting powerful defendants with a lot of money. And then we called my, I called my old buddy, Michael Pitt, who I've known for many, many years. And we all joined together, and we are called the Flint Water Cross Class Action Legal Team. And again, no matter what Dana Nestle has done, no matter what else anybody else is doing, we're here to fight for you, and we're going to fight for you. We are Flint Strong. Okay. Now, with that being said, I am honored to um, introduce you to Dr. Nicole Jones. She's the director of the Flint Registry, a component of Dr. Mana Hash. Hannah Atisha's Flint Pediatric Public Health Initiative, and she's going to give you some advice about that. So I'm Nicole's twin sister, Deborah Furholden. Oh, okay. oh, <laughs> Nicole's going to go right after me because the registry is super important, and it's a part of what we're doing at MSU. Sorry, we didn't tell you about the little no, switch. Okay. And I thought it'd be funny to be Nicole's twin. <laughs> so my name is Deborah Furholden, and I am. I just. Uh, got promoted yesterday. I'm the new Associate Dean for Public Health Integration at MSU. And the Director of the Division of Public Health at our MSU Flint campus. Um, what we've created at MSU to me is nothing short of a miracle, but we didn't create it. The community created it. We did that in partnership with you. If you were one of the people about eight to ten years ago who worked on that, could you raise your hand? But we had about 30, 40 community people, and that's Yvonne Lewis, my partner in, um, in public health. And so we're here because the community wanted us here. The, the model that we use is we don't do anything to people. We do it with you. Right. You are our partners. We will not impose anything on you. We are your partners. And Bishop Jefferson knows that very well. Yes, I do. Um, just a couple quick things that I want to highlight about um, our work is that we are here to protect and preserve the public health. We are that people will not forget. Nicole's going to tell you about the registry. I can't tell you how important the registry is because it is the best tool that we have to both document the long-term effects and also to intervene on them. See, we don't want to just observe the problem. We actually want to bring solutions to the problem. So that's what I'm telling you representing MSU and the Division of Public Health, you can count on us for. We will be your partners in making sure that people don't forget and protecting and preserving the public health long term. One of the big things that we've done is we have supported Medicaid expansion in Flint. And you know it's important because we know the medical impacts of lead exposure and other things. You are entitled to services and care out of that. That will end predictably if we don't make the case ongoingly. So something else that our division is doing is doing the work to evaluate who's accessing those services. 
Who have we not done the right job and the right level of outreach to get? And we are your partners also in ensuring that that continues. Now I'm gonna hand it over to my partner, Nicole Jones, who's also a Spartan alum, um, and she's gonna tell you about the Flint Lead Exposure Registry. Thank you. Um, just a real quick moment of your time to tell you a little bit about the Flint Registry. It's a project that's really individuals who are impacted by the Flint water crisis because they lived in Flint, went to school in Flint, worked in Flint, or, or attended daycare in Flint during the time that we were using Flint River water, so April 2014 to October 2015. We want to make sure that people are getting connected to resources and services in the community to support their health. Um, Kristen talked a little bit already about the NCE. That's just one of 30 services that we're trying to make sure that families get connected to. And then the second thing that we're doing is what Deborah talked about, is really trying to understand the impact on people's health, both mental health and physical health, of living through the Flint water crisis. So we're asking people to complete a survey about their health to help us understand how it has affected you. Um, and really an opportunity to tell your story. Um, we already have over 7,000 people who have signed up to say that they're interested. Um, and we have over 1,000 people who've already completed those surveys that are in the process of getting referred to services. But we know that over 100,000 people were impacted. And the more people that share their story, the more powerful the registry is to really show what the impact is on the Flint community and what services and programs we need to continue to fund to support Flint. Um, it is, I just want to be clear, it's not something that's funded through the lawsuit. It's actually a, a separate program that's funded through a grant to Michigan State University from the CDC. So it's not something that was funded through the lawsuit, but we did want to share that information with you tonight. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. If you it might be interested, if you'd like to receive more information, we have a table at the back. If you want to share your name and phone number and have us call and answer questions, we're happy to do that as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we're going to have Dr. Uh, Pastor Monica Villarreal. Yay! Yay! You're talking about a warrior for you guys. She is a warrior for you. It is great to be with all of you uh, this evening. I want to share a few resources. First, I'd like to begin with all of us doing a shout out to the many faith-based institutions that have risen to the occasion to step in when government failed us. Yeah. How many of you have gone to a church, a mosque, a synagogue, a faith-based institution to receive services that our government ought to be providing? That's right. We provide. We provide. <laughs> As a faith leader in this community, I've been one of so many who have stood up to work with you as partners in our community to advocate for resources. We have stepped up with the resources that we have and even resources in which we don't have to share with our community. Many churches especially have risen up to provide bottled water. I wanna give a shout out to our three help centers yeah. that continue to provide bottled water and recovery resources as their UMC, Bethel UMC and Greater Holy Temple. They have been on the ground for a very long time. And other faith institutions that have continued to give out of their own resources to provide bottled water for residents. I think of the West Street Court Church. I think of the Holy Trinity downtown. I think of so many. Shout them out. Prince of Mount Peace. Zion. Mount Zion. Mount Avenue. Boss Avenue. Second Chance. The Faith Living Center. Asbury. Woodside. So many others, including my own at Salem Lutheran Church, who's been on the ground with so many of you for such a long time. I want to point out, in addition to my work as pastor, I'm also a community organizer with Michigan United. We have a table in the back. I want to draw your attention to an excellent opportunity. We know in Flint that part of what happened is that we were poisoned by policy. We need to work to change government policy so that Flint doesn't happen again to anyone else. And that means that Flint must continue to be on the national level in a national story. Michigan United is one of the host organizations this year too. 
have a presidential forum. We will be inviting all presidential candidates for this upcoming election to right. speak at Cobo Hall in Detroit. All right. What we are doing in Flint is that I'm hosting listening circles. It's important that the voice of Flint be a part of shaping that forum. Yeah. It's our questions that need to be answered. And Flint and our story continues to receive national attention. We know it's not fixed here. So I invite you to the back table afterwards, or feel free to speak with me. Uh, there's some pamphlets about the presidential forum. Sign up if you'd like to be a part of a listening circle to have your voice become a part of that presidential forum. We've committed to having at least two buses from Flint travel to Cobo Hall for the event. So if you're interested in that, leave your name and contact information in the back. Also on the table, you will find a resource there that is the From Crisis to Recovery resource. It includes a lot of information um, that the community provided to us through a survey as well as other additional resources available in the community. We want, we're here to help resource you and to be a partner with you as we continue to fight together for justice. Thank you. Thank you. Pastor Monica has some news to share, everybody. <laughs> we go into the chapel and we're going to get married. <laughs> October 26th, and all are invited. To that. <laughs> okay. Next on our list would have been Dr. Larry Lawrence Reynolds, uh, Michigan pediatrician. You all know him. He's fought for you. He stood up for you. However, he was not able to be here today. So we got to go on now to Ms. Claire McClinton, a uh, Flint water warrior. She's associated with a lot of different organizations. She's Flintstone and Flintstone. <laughs> Well, thank you for uh, this lovely audience. And uh, we in Flint are fortunate to have the support we have from these attorneys, yes. uh, our church community. We sit here, the home of the Flint sit-down strike is this union hall. And if you look at the pictures around you, you can see that we are a city that was steeped in social justice. We do not back down. <laughs> we have a civil rights legacy, a union legacy, and a social justice legacy. And we ain't gonna give it up. Now, we still have a toxic water problem. Yeah. We still have health care problems. Yeah. We still have water bills too high to pay problems. Yeah. And we still have a democracy problem. Yeah. But when they took on Flint and attacked us trying to steal our water rights, and poisoning this water and all the rest, they messed with the wrong city. Thank you very much. All right, all right. All right. All right. Now, where's Bishop? Come on up, Bishop. Everybody knows Bishop. Pastor of Faith Deliverance Center Church and Flint Community Activist. She's marched with us. She's marched for us. She's spoken on behalf of Flint residents, and she's here to give you a few words of encouragement. Bishop Ernell Jefferson. I want to say good evening to each and every one. Kind of an honor and a privilege to be here. And I know many of you have seen me, walk, seen me walk in late tonight, but my grandson that I've had on national TV that was in 2014, 2015, was supposed to be an academic ambassador for the city of Flint. He was eight years old at that time. Well, and he didn't go to Washington until he went from an A.B. student 
to a DEF student. So in 2016, he did go to Washington because he was a DEF student. But I want to say tonight he graduated from the eighth grade. It wasn't easy, and it was hard work. For a young man that used to read for 20 minutes at a time, and then we couldn't get him to sit there for five minutes because his tension span was not there. One that would just stand up in church and just walk away from his post because he was an urchin, because his tension span was not there. Did we scold him? No. But we did work with him and we continue to work with him. I took time to sit there and read with him. And even watch him when his mind would begin to wonder. But that's why I fight today. It's a personal vendetta for me. And I've been fighting since 2011. I start off saying, this is not a water crisis. This is an emergency manager crisis. <laughs> this is the effect and the result of the Public Act 4. That's right. Flint, Michigan emergency manager law that turned us over from democracy to dictatorship. That's right. And we're taking back what the enemy has stole from us. We fight. See, when, when nobody else would fight and when no, the people that we elected to stand up and fight for us, the people that we elected to speak out for us, they didn't do it. But there were grassroots organizations that stood up and fought, stood up and had a voice, and we ain't stopping, we ain't taking back, we ain't taking down, we gonna continue to fight until we win, and together we shall win. Together we fight together. When they say no, we continue to say yes. Because we have an invested interest in this city, in this state. Why do I say state? Because Flynn is not the only one that's been affected. Our schools have not been the only one affected. Last month we were in Benton Harbor. Before that we was in Detroit. So we continue to fight. Yeah. Want to make one announcement that the, the Flint Women's Study Community Action Network, and I am one of the chairs over that, and it, we and studied 100 women to see what they wanted, what were their problems. Are any of those women here tonight? We had a meeting, thank you. We had a meeting scheduled tonight and I said, the best thing to do, we're not canceling the meeting. We're just moving it to another location. That's right. Because it's important that we get facts and information. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you very much. Well, I guess that concludes my portion of uh, facilitating. And now we're going to open the floor up to you guys to ask questions. This is your opportunity. Please don't be shy. Can I have the attorneys all come up, please? Michael, Ted, Teresa, Julie, Bill Goodman. Where is Bill? I saw Bill hiding in the back. Come on up, Bill. Paul, Greg. <laughs> For this portion, we're going to ask that you have one question. We want to make sure we've allocated enough time for everyone to ask their questions. 
If you want to direct your question to a particular person, you can do that. If not, then we'll allow the person that's most appropriate to answer and address your issue have that. This time frame, we have until about 8.30, so we have about 45 minutes for question and answer. So please, if you have questions, now is the time. And Quincy, we'll go ahead and start with you. Kristen? No, Jeremy. Oh, Jeremy. Jeremy. Is he still here? He's in the back. Jeremy Orr? Where'd he go? Got a question for you, sir. <laughs> go ahead, Quincy. He can hear you. My question to the NRC is, you guys um, went and did a lawsuit settlement for the $97 million on behalf of the residents of the city of Memphis to get the service line in place. And doing that, that lawsuit also um, stopped the uh, water distribution um, for residents that was a vital need. Why in the world would you guys stop, make a settlement that uh, had a cause in there to stop water distribution when the service line just wasn't um, in place? And that's why they, um, that was part of why they did and stuff. These lines is not in place. And Settle that and then even come to the residents and ask us what we thought and what we found out that we was like how horrific of you guys to um, make a settlement like that and stop the bottle of water and now we're scrambling trying to figure out this uh, single citizen and all the other people don't have uh, ways to get. That's right. Yeah. No, thank, thank you for the question. And, and you know, I, I want to provide some, some, some clarity on that. So the, the ceasing of the distribution of water was never part of our settlement. So the injunction that we filed before the settlement took place was a law, was an injunction that required the state to even give the water. So in the, between the time and the settlement, we filed the injunction that required the state to give the water. However, that injunction from the federal required the state to give the water until the lead service line replacement began to happen. Uh, so that time ran, basically it, it, it lapsed. So it was never part of the settlement, it was never part of uh, any sort of negotiation to get one thing or another. Uh, it was simply the time that lapsed on it and it was within the, the, the state's purview as according to the federal government's injunction, the federal court's injunction, to cease giving that water. Uh, but at no point do we negotiate away or trade off um, the, the distribution of water in our settlement. That's, that's, that's nowhere in it. it it's just the, the timing of it uh, essentially occurred in the timing that it did. But after a year of that, um, the state decided to stop the distribution of water. Thank you. I'm not trying to debate. I have a question. Speaking to the mic, Art. I'm not trying to debate because that's absolutely incorrect. Can you lift it up? I think, uh, I'm not trying to debate because that's absolutely incorrect. Uh, we did negotiate in December. Uh, the state was supposed to have to make sure that every house had a filter. And then y'all came back after December 2017 and came back to the table and the pods were shutting down. And they went back to the governor and told the governor, hey, y'all need to let us keep on doing it until October. It was negotiated because once the EPA said that the uh, standard was reached, uh, pops stopped in. But my thing is, and like I said, I'm not trying to debate, but if you go back and read the settlement, you will see that. My, my, my question is to the lawyers. I don't have any problems with the lawyers or class action. My thing is, is that last week you saw where 9-11, the first responders, had to go back to the legislators to get money. Yeah. All right. I don't believe in handshakes and word of mouth saying I promise I will do that. We need things in writing because what's going on here is that we're only speaking about later. Mm -hmm. And we have a whole lot of other things That's in this water. We have cocktail. And the only people that are being serviced are the kids and the seniors, which should happen, but we're missing the middle people. 
The cancer cluster studies, if you notice, we have had a lot of deaths with cancer, leukemia, multiple melanoma, uh, B cell, T cell. In the report in November 2014, Land did a jar test, and it showed that when the DTA film was at the highest level, they showed that it was a sewer leak upstream from the intake of the water treatment plant, mm -hmm. which was causing chloroform, which caused the TTHM. No one is talking about that. And if you look at the ACSBR report from kind of June 1957-1985, it showed that the veterans had cancer within two years of drinking contaminated water for over 30 days. We, we, for you all, because all we're talking about is lead, because lead is the easy thing to prove right now. And like you said earlier, Michelle, we got advisory letters that states uh, 70 years, you will have cancer if you weigh 154 pounds, two years a day at 0.80 parts per billion. We need for you to write in there, in the seven, that we will be funded for the rest of our life. From America, I see your face. I know it's going to be a hard attack, but they poison us. It was a man made disease. Yes, sir. The terrorists, it wasn't natural, it was human, man made. Governor Snyder and his culprits are just as bad as those terrorists. Come on. All right, man. We need the people in the city of Flint has not been made whole. It's not about money. Because chemotherapy, cancer treatment, costs a lot. You can give me a hundred dollars a day. I'm gonna spend that. But my long-term treatment is for the rest of my life. And we're gonna be bottled, bottled down with, with insurance costs, co-pay, and everything else. Can you promise us that when you go in these back rooms, and negotiate, that you would negotiate on the medical part of this agreement that the people in between can get insurance that will cover us for free something, that's what they call it, free something illnesses, and ask for a cancer cluster study so that we can determine what cause of cancer causing from the water so that we can go to the doctor and say, hey, that water caused this cancer right yeah. here. We need treatment for it. We need waterborne illness doctors here that can diagnose us with the real thing instead of assuming because they are practitioners and they practice medicine. We need somebody who knows medicine. So can, can you definitely go in there and ask for a settlement? Thank you. I'm sorry to take up some more time. <laughs> Thank you for uh, it's a very important question. Because this is a class action settlement, it will, it, when the settlement occurs, it will be a class action settlement. That means that the settlement has to be approved by Judge Levy. She will review it, she will hear the arguments, for it, she'll hear arguments against it. She may have her own research. She may call upon medical and, env and environmental experts to comment on the proposed settlement. She will listen to each and every one of you. You'll have an opportunity to voice your concerns, uh, voice your agreement, voice your disagreement. And it's a very difficult task for Judge Levy. And in cases like this, there will be people who agree and there will be people who don't agree. She has to find a way to get it resolved in a fair and equitable way. She will do it. We've worked with Judge Levy for about three years. You know, she is tireless. She's brilliant. She cares deeply about the people of Flint, if you've been in her courtroom, she typically will start her court sessions 
by talking about her concern about the people of Flint. So we can assure you that it will be in writing. We can assure you that it will be approved by the court. We can assure you that before it becomes a, a final deal, you will have an opportunity to voice your opinion about it. Um, it it's not going to be perfect because in our world, you know nothing is perfect. If it's fair, reasonable, and equitable, Judge Levy will approve it. Ted, any other comments? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Yes, ma'am. Hi, um, my name is Christina Murphy, and um, I kind of have a statement slash question. Um, a lot of us are very affected. Um, our children, um, especially every age. I'm sorry, I'm emotional. I can't help it. My son sometimes, you know, is falling down and hitting himself, you know, on the ground and bruises all over his face. And my daughter, she just got um, an IEP that she has lead poisoning um, affecting her education. Um, I am in 24 7 pain and um, I've seen some of my friends die, and expanded Medicare for life for everyone affected needs to happen. I'd rather have my life and my children's life than any of the money, <laughs> because I don't want to watch my kids and my friends die anymore. All right. So, if my pain just helps you play a little harder, that's all I'm asking. And um, thank you for all the hard work you've been doing. And I appreciate you all so much. I appreciate everybody in this room that hasn't forgotten about us. And uh, I love you all. God bless. Okay? Thank you, Christina. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Layton Jefferson. Uh, I got a couple of questions up right here. I have a question I've got then. Are the law firms going to have an office here for the next 15 or 20 years? One, Michelle, I know that you'll be here probably the next 40 years. The question of the rest of you would be here. You keep talking about a settlement. We're not interested in settling. We're interested in going to the max. It looks like we got a lot of time. Those young people down there, I think we got their lifetime to tell the people's life. We're not interested in settling. We're not interested in taking 40% out of the dollar. We're interested in the whole dollar plus something. Miss Bransford. Good evening. My name is Sharice Branson. Hold on one second, Sharice. Yes. Uh, Attorney Leopold is going to address his concerns real quick. So thanks for the question, and it's an appropriate question to ask. There are two aspects to any lawsuit. There's the aspect of taking a case all the way through trial, and there's the aspects of a potential settlement. None of us have a crystal ball. I can't answer that question for you today. All we can tell you is that we will do what is the best in the city of Flint. Everyone has a right to their day in court, whether it's an individual case or a class case. Those individuals that are part of the class and are representing the class have a duty and obligation by the court to do what is in the best interest of the class. And if they deem that it is in the best interest of the class to litigate the case all the way through trial, then that's what will be done. If it is not, and it is the best interest of the class to potentially settle because they may not get everything, but they get a damn lot of what they need, health related issues, infrastructure issues, and all of those things are the same that one would get through a trial then those are issues that have to be taken into consideration. 
I can't answer for you right now what is going to happen. All I can tell you is we are working our hardest to make sure that the decisions are the best decisions based upon what is available at the time that we make those decisions and the class representatives make those decisions. Okay? You didn't get the first part of the question. The first part of the question was, are there going to be representatives oh. or lawyers or attorneys here we have that we can go to after this case is settled? The office that is here now, that is part of this group, will be staying until everything is resolved, all questions are resolved, and everything follows through to provide the help that everybody needs. I don't envision that stopping any time in the near future. Whether the cases settle, whether they go to trial, whether there's an appeal. So for the foreseeable future, we all will be here, this office will be here. Okay. All right, Ms. Bransford. Thank you. My name is Sharice Bransford, and I actually work for um, a school district who my title is I work with behavior students. And I wanted to talk with Attorney Totten because I do see those behaviors displayed with those students. And a lot of our students, I do not work in a Flint school district, but I work in a neighboring school district. And my question is because of that, the amount of behavior issues that we do see, I'm with Attorney Totten, a lot of it has really nothing to do with their the discipline or the lack of discipline at home. Because a lot of our students are Flint students, because we are outside of the Flint school district, my question is, will we, would the students that live in Flint that goes to other school districts receive services in those buildings because for a person like me and for my special ed director, it's, and my administrators, it, 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 it can be a little, to get some help, to help us yeah. keep the kid in, in, in the building. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that's my question. Too. Yeah, that's, that's a great question because I'm sure there's other families here that may have kids that um, are in charter schools because you've been looking for an educational option as the Flint Community Schools has really struggled. Um, so our lawsuit represents all children that reside within the Flint Community School District. Even if you go to a different school but you live in the Flint Community School District, you are a part of our group, okay? And what that means is you can, first of all, you can get the relief um, for the Neurodevelopmental Center of Excellence that's run through the Genesee Healthcare System, getting your kid evaluated, and then being able to take that evaluation to your charter school or other school, and that is an evaluation that they must consider. And they need to absorb that into the IEP planning, and the district does need to be responsive to the needs of the children. We did not name all of the charter schools, which there are many within the city of Flint, but part of the reason that Flint Community Schools is in the condition that it's in is because it's lost so many students to the charters and to the school of choice, right? And it's intentional segregation of the highest need children in the Flint Community Schools and we want to make sure that they get the relief that they're entitled to because we're looking for system change, right? We're not looking, our, our settlement in, in our lawsuit is not about getting financial outcomes for the kids, but it's making the systems responsive to the kids' needs. And what I can do is I go into charter schools if they will have me. I'll explain what the lawsuit is. I can tell what relief because I know a lot of children are being served by the surrounding districts. Um, and then they can start, you know, we can start working towards getting the MDE to be responsive to the needs of the Flint children through that avenue. It may be different things, but not necessarily through the lawsuit. Does that make sense? No, it doesn't. Okay. <laughs> no, at the mic. You take control. <laughs> Mr. Jefferson, please don't. No, no. Ms. Branford, did she answer your question? 
innocence. But as long as they live in the city, what she's saying is they're still eligible if they get evaluated. Like, Flint had to get nurses into each one of those schools. Mm -hmm. I do not work for a charter school. I work for Westwood High School. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. that's what I'm talking about, like the services and the resources yeah. to come into the building to help assist us okay. with our students that right. need both so, our positions that lives outside our district. I appreciate that, and thank you for the clarification about Hamity School District, a public, traditional public school. Um, Genesee Intermediate School District really needs to be providing for the needs, and your special education director should be going to Lisa Hagel and to Sherry Wager at the GISD to say, we know that our children need these things based upon the evaluations that are coming out of the NCE, but also just having the conversation about what is being given to the kids that reside in Flint but are attending through School of Choice other districts. But our lawsuit had to name the Flint Community Schools, and that's where we're seeking to change the system, right? But the Genesee Intermediate School District has the obligation to keep track of every child with an IEP irregardless of where they're going to school and make sure that they get what they're entitled to. <laughs> Sorry, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Laura Sullivan. Thank you. Um, normally, I'm at, I mean, like I'm just trying to speak on behalf of all of this. The question I have today is mostly for me and probably for some others. Um, I have still not heard uh, really any, seen any motion on my own service line, but it's um, I have a service line that if I'm gone for more than a few days and I turn my faucet up on, I hear a, a sucking sound. Um, I got Shigella in 2016. I still believe it was for my own water. Um, about six weeks ago, maybe two months, I got something in the mail, a flyer in the mail, kind of a trifle. Could have easily thrown it out because it didn't look at all official. And basically it was a form that I had to fill out and I had three days to send it in to some office in Flint. And if I didn't turn it in within 30 days, then I risked not getting my service line replaced. Mm -hmm. I sent that in. And then two weeks later I got an email saying that I needed to sign a form and scan it and send it in. And I had, uh, I think, two weeks in which to do that or risk not getting my service line replaced. And and my understanding was that this was not an opt-in kind of situation. <laughs> and twice I've been I've been threatened with being pushed out if I didn't fill out or send something in. I don't feel well represented, Mr. Or I do not feel rep well represented at this point. If that's something that NRD is in charge of, I don't feel like I'm being well represented. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for that question. So so in terms of oversight, we don't govern the process for for land service line replacement opt-in. However, you're correct, right? Like you don't, there is no 30-day window, right? The trifold that you got a few weeks ago, maybe about two months ago uh, in April, if I'm correct, we ended up reaching out to the city about that as well, just how you know easily it could have been thrown out. One thing that's important to understand, um, at any point, you can opt into this program. Even if you decline, you can opt into this program months later, right? So even if, even if they're telling you you need to fill this out within 30 days, whether you do or you don't, if at any point, and we have declination people on the ground who are following up, so if you need to follow up with somebody, we have a declination person in the back right now. Ever. We should right. never have to opt in. Right, right, I, I agree, 100%. You need to ever come out from the very beginning, there was never any indication that anybody would ever have to opt in. Right. Even if they feel like intimidation and bullying, and if you were aware of that, if, if somebody from the legal team was aware that this was happening to residents, and it's only now that I'm hearing that you were aware of it, and that there was something being done in the background, I'm sorry, but that just doesn't feel like representation. Yeah, so it feels like I'm being intimidated and bullied. I've been in the room with the director of public works, who has told me to my face that in my neighborhood there's not enough chlorine. I hear a sock coming from my service line, and then, and then I get two times these letters, and I never get anything from anybody officially who, who's supposed to be representing me, saying, if you get something like this, don't worry. 
So I think I'm yeah. sorry, but <laughs> I've kind of had it <laughs> with all of these uh, different versions of being with being present and and yeah. and, 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 and uh, sort of fully into thinking that maybe I won't qualify or maybe I won't get something. And I'm able to come here and speak to myself. I don't know how many other people are in this situation. But but I don't have a way of being to them and letting them know that this is something that, that should not be done to us. And I don't know who's on your side and this is the city or the state or the feds and who who's the good guy and who's the bad guy. I just I just know that you are a person among a team of people who represent me and the rest of us. And and there are these sort of so the question time to come that we're not going to take it. That's right. So I just see it. No, thank you. Thank you for your comment. Yes, sir. What's my name? Everybody else is there. You forgot my name? Tony Palladino. Yeah. That's bullshit. <laughs> that ain't it? That's Don't it. do that again. You're my lawyer. That's right. What's your question? Today is the birthday of a friend, a warrior. Back in the day when we cleaned. And I mean, we cleaned in green. He died on my son's birthday, June 3rd, bleeding from his ears. This is bullshit. And I'm telling you, Michelle, don't you ever forget my name. Please. And to have her tell you, as we stood in Ramsey, I'm telling you, hon, I watched my doctor cry. She's not my doctor. She's my sister. He's my brother. And no answers have been answered tonight. Let me tell you about your registry. You're four years too late. What was wrong with my friend in 2014 when Gleason, Bruce Sears, went into that federal room and told him we need a resident? We got $15 million to kill me to boot this shit in the ass. And yeah, I'm talking like this. I was on the hillside of my park. I'm dirty today because you know what? I don't talk to shit. I walk it. And you can't tell me that these people ain't getting their fingernails dirty and they're making all this money, administration fees, and I'm tired of them. You know where my wife is? My wife, you know what her name is? What's her name? You're representing. And I know you can't know all the names, all of you. Stand up. What's your name? You with a hat grinning all the time. I'm calling you out. I'm calling you out. Don't come tell me you're going to represent me when you can't even know my name. You know my face, I've been fighting with these guys for years. We're paid off. No, we're not. I'm scared right now. No. This guy is bleeding from his ears. You know what? I have a three street neighborhood. No, look away, man. I'm talking to you too. I got a three street neighborhood, four streets wide, and I live on the edge of Jersey Park, and they built a $200 million school, and all the artsy parts, which we need. Nine people died. Cancer. Brain aneurysms. No one's come in to say shit. No one's come in. Nine people in a four block area. And guess why I'm still here? Because I get to sneak away and drink some fresh water. Forget your registry. It's dead. It's old news. I want to know what happened to my sister who blew her up and died. And I'm telling you something else. The next time this man steps up and has to yell to get this question out, listen. I'm not going to address that, but I live in Flint. I went to Flint Northern. I have three kids in Flint. And I want to know, whatever. I want to know the impact. I want to know the impact. I moved here. I moved here in the middle I could bring to bear. 
every bit of training. I trained at the number one school of public health in the world, at Johns Hopkins University. I left a tenured professorship because it didn't make sense to me that an entire city could be poisoned. And I knew that we needed not just good public health professionals, but people who were willing to be bold and get out there on the skinny branches, like Dr. Mona, like myself. You need researcher activists, and that's what I am. So your question about, thank you. Your, your, the question that you asked, sir, about, you know, it's not about the money, I agree with you. One of the things that we've been advocating for is you've got to put something in the settlement for program where we will have the capacity and the ability to look long term and see what the impact is. See, as a matter of fact, what's going to happen is when your children who suffered this assault and have neurocognitive problems and all of that, whatever. You were talking. I didn't tell you to be quiet and get out of here. You were robbing other people of the right to hear. I'm not talking to you. My point is. I live in Florida. I lived on Pontiac Street. I live on Vanderbilt Drive. I live here now. But, but just let me help you. Could we have some order? We would like to continue to answer questions. We started, we're, we're depriving people of the right to ask questions. So please wait until someone gets to the mic. Okay, let us let us move on. People have the right to ask questions. No, it's not crazy. So I am not the legal team. I'm not the legal team. Okay, we're ready for the next person to speak. So I, I just have to say something before you speak. I know that rumors can run rampant. My integrity as an attorney was attacked. I am not being paid off for anything. I am here because I care and I'm working for you. And I want to continue to work for you. I'm not saying that we cannot take criticisms. We want your input. We need your input to do the best jobs we could do, but we need your cooperation so that we can finish this discussion tonight and continue it later. So please, let us come together in unity and look for some solutions. So ma'am, would you please stand forward? I'm going to sit down and give it back to Trisha. Thank you, Teresa. Yes, ma'am. Um, my first question is, I'm always big on transparency. And I'm an activist, I'm on the ground. I think I went to Nigeria to represent them. But one of the things that has bothered me, and I'm glad you guys are all here, and whoever else is listening on social media or whoever needs to hear this, um, where are the updates? I can't keep up what's going on, and I'm calling myself on the ground and involved. I think that some type of way there should be monthly emails going out updating residents on what the hell is going on. When I travel, people are asking you, what's up there? I just did an interview with Vice HBO. What's up there? I don't have those dates because, number one, when I send people to the office, there's no one there, you know, and they're not able to give me questions back. If you call the number, you may get no one, you may not. So I think that if you could, please set up something where residents can get updates, even if it's just a website that you guys have. But just like the uh, racer, racer, don't that a group of people who came up for racer? I get updates from them constantly on what's going on. And I think this is so important and it's going to drag on for so long that we should know every single thing that's going on when it happens, not the next day or a week later. This should be where we know in real time what's going on with our attorneys in this lawsuit. Well, I'd like, I'd like to respond to that briefly and anyone else who has anything to say can also chime in. Well, not everybody in this room is part of our, our team. We're the Flint Water Class Action Legal Team. If you're not, you may not be getting newsletters, but the people on our clients, they get newsletters every month. 
and we keep them informed every month of what's going on. Mm -hmm. So, if, so if you if you were a different attorney, then you need to address it to no, that attorney. We have a website. Regardless if you with your team or not, because we all are employed. Yeah, I know. And I think this should not just be Clinton County, but all the counties should be doing this. Yeah. Because it's not just Clinton County. 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 Maybe in the township they have one pipes and they're all poisoned. And that lead levels came back high. Raise your hand if you want to find it. Drunk dirty water for 18 months because I can tow out and half the water. So I think this should be some type of update. Not coming down on you guys, like I said, whoever's listening out there that can maybe get this done, but we need some type of update for every resident, not just the ones who have signed their name on the dotted line. Everybody should be updated at all times about what's going on. Because if you're updated and you're not in it, you might want to join your team Absolutely. to know what's going on well, we, and get some transparency. Well, we've got to give you a website that you can go to. Okay. Well, we're going to have to get some more information out there. And then the second part of my question is, what about the people that are not in the county? Because they have to be in the county. Let, let me answer the first part, and then you can go into the second part. So we do have a website. Our website is flintwaterclassaction.com. And on that website, you can get updated, you know, at your convenience. And we try to keep that updated with all. There's a lot of rulings because we have a lot of cases in a lot of places. So we're not going to be able to send out correspondence every time something happens. So really, the, the best way for you to stay informed is to check our website. FlintWaterClassAction.com. We also have an office on Robert T. Longway, right behind the Holiday Inn. So uh, that office is open on Mondays and Thursdays. Those are the, the days of you send somebody on Tuesday, Wednesday, or Friday. Right. Right. So Mondays and Thursdays, uh, Miss Taylor is here. She's the one that's at the office running it. And Taylor, what are the hours? I'm here from 9 to 5. 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Mondays and Thursdays. I appreciate that, but I think that's something that we should have been on. It's not such a five years in. All right. Well, the other second part of my question is on the children. I have a child, and I chose to take her out of schools for a number of reasons. One of the reasons was the water. The other reason was the support condition of my school. And I think I, someone up there may correct me if I'm wrong, but I've heard that there's a bill that's trying to pass where Regardless if your child goes to a Flint school or a public school or a private school, that they can get some type of uh, additional funding. Um, and I hope that happens because a lot of us parents have opted out of Flint school. Mm -hmm. And we all know why. Mm -hmm. I mean, when my daughter went to a Flint school, the water faucet was, had a black garbage bag over it for an entire school year. Mm -hmm. Who wants, you know, who wants to send your child to school like that? Um, so I put her in a private school. But since I put her in a private school, I feel like she's been left out. And mm -hmm. she has had some behavioral issues and um, cognitive issues and uh, back dressing. Mm -hmm. um, she was an A student, now she's not, you know, things like that. She's seen a behavioral special thing to Dr. Mona told me I should do that. Mm -hmm. But that's because I'm kind of privileged, because I'm kind of in the mix. But the people that I deal with on a daily basis are not in the mix. And it should be where every child, regardless if you are homeschooled, if you go to Power, if you go to St. John Vianney, if you go to Pierce Elementary, mm -hmm. every student, every child, every adult, because if I'm dead and sick, I can't take care of her, should be able to get services. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be so hard that I'm looking at Southwest and m and giving them backpacks and my daughter can't get it because she goes to a private school. And then I can't get any funding from the state to help me with that. The state's the reason why she got to get a private school because okay. they poison it. We, we got your question, but we, we got about five minutes left and we want to get to everybody that's in line. So, sir, you will be the last person to ask your question. Uh, Ms. Totten is going to address her question and we're going to make sure everyone asks one question so everybody can get their questions answered. Sir, the gentleman in the white is going to be the last one that, that we take. So, ma'am, we're going to let you answer that okay. question and then we'll go to the okay. next. Thank you. Just really quickly, um, if your child resides in the city of Flint and Flint Community Schools is your resident school district, they are part of our class. We have filed a class action motion. It hasn't been heard as of yet. We're trying to get relief in settlement 
for, but those are the kids that we are seeking to represent. So even if you've opted to go somewhere else, you're still entitled to the benefit for our first settlement, which is the Neurodevelopmental Center of Excellence, to get your child fully evaluated. And then if she needs um, an IEP or support, the unfortunate thing with a private school is they're not so much under the um, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, because it's a free, appropriate public education, but the Genesee Intermediate School District and, their, and also Flint Community Schools is supposed to be providing you with ancillary services that you can contact the, the district about. But the first step, and everyone here, please go to the NCE. It's through the registry, but you can also, as a parent, directly refer your kid there to make sure that they get that evaluation. And then if it's not getting absorbed correctly by the school, reach out to the ACLU of Michigan. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I'm here because um, I have gloves. Um, I never wash my dishes with um, I always use gloves. Um, but what I'm here is because of the orthophosphate chemicals. Um, I noticed when they started using the orthophosphate chemicals, um, even though you have filters in your sink, you don't have filters for the washing machine. So I started, and this is embarrassing because I don't, it's something embarrassing, but I started getting a lot of itching in my private part, and then I started getting rashes on both sides. So, when, um, and I'm sure there's quite a few people here because there's women that I've talked to that have gotten these, um, it's the itching, but it's, it's an unbearable itching. And so what I did is I, I'm a Christian, I started asking and praying and asking, um, you know, God, but so, what I did is I stopped washing my underwear in the washing machine and I started doing it in the, you know, the water line and it disappeared. So I started talking to other women. But these gloves, I dated them and this one was March 11th and look at how it's been damaged with holes. This is just March 11th, what year? Of this year. And I had other gloves and because I put this stuff in this bag, um, these, like, 2017, but they start getting holes. They start getting holes and um, all kinds of things, you know, just, you see how they look. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is just a lot. What's your question, ma'am? Well, what I would like for you all to do is there's teachers, substitute teachers, and teachers that are in the schools that are seeing their children, these young children, itching down there. And they're scratching their eyes, but nobody, they're talking about the lab, but they're not talking about the orphite, I mean the orphophosphate chemical. The chemicals, there's other chemicals, or that chemical, I noticed, is when that started happening. So if you could please check into that, because there are a lot of children, and I'm sure there's men and women that have itch in their private part. Yes, it's embarrassing, but someone has to talk about it. Yeah. And the itching is, is unbearable. And the doctors don't know what it is. I, it, they don't know. They, they, or they probably know, but we know that there's a lot of things that have not been in our favor with them. They're covering up just like the government and you know, all the others. But these children are suffering in the schools. There's people that are going to doctors and nobody, they're just talking about the lead. They're not talking about this orthopathic chemical that's very strong. And I know they're saying it's supposed to mid the pipe. I'm not a scientist or chemist, but what are you trying to mend? The river where, where destroyed those pipes, they have holes in them. They, they have how many main breaks? If you were to get records, if you could please even check the records of all the main breaks. We've had many break, main breaks in, in the Flint area. I mean, these are things that no one is talking about. And our children are suffering, people are suffering, went to the doctor and no one... Okay, we, we'll make a note of that concern. I mean, if you want to look at these gloves, I mean, I'm going to take time. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Again, we are running out of time. We only have this room reserved for a specific amount of time, so if you could kind of really go quickly. I'll be short. Um, my name is Olivia Holden. Um, Dr. Holden out there, my mother. And there have been countless nights, number one, where we living in the city of Flint have, me and my siblings have ate dinner by ourselves because my mother is doing work for this city because that's what she cares about. It's what we came here for. Um, everybody up there, we advocate for everyone in this room, and nobody is decided in this room because of the people up there. So, we have to learn, I can show you my balls, I can show you the pen from the skin that's just gone because we live in Flint. But my question is, as a Flint resident, I have not seen my lines in my neighborhood be replaced. Why do 
just the service line because there's somewhere we can see the information or data for when these lines have been replaced, what lines have been replaced, and things of that nature. So as it relates to the land service line replacement, there is a list uh, based on the model that I mentioned that prioritizes homes that are most likely to have land service lines over a certain percentage. That list, uh, we have access to that list. If we can connect afterwards, we can figure out how to check it. But because of, of the names and, and addresses, that list is anonymous due to legal reasons, right? So they can't publish that publicly because of you know, where people stay and, and, and what homes are, are, are there. But we can definitely connect for sure. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Oh, oh, my mouth. <laughs> Hi. My name's Lynn Paul. I live in over uh, Mill Hamburg area. You have a quick synopsis. I have lost three toilets, three sinks, a wash machine, a uh, garbage disposal, coffee pot. Um, uh, what's the big one? Oh, yeah. A water heater. I've also experienced, uh, I barely tried engineers. Mm. I've also lost um, members seeing my small vision disappear, my animals dying, and on top of that, I'm losing my teeth because they, they're just rotting now because of, because of blood exposure, all the chemical exposure. Okay, my question. I'm a disabled senior on a fixed income. Because I've lost so many appliances, and because of the hot water heater in particular, I was concerned about because I heard from a meeting a long time ago that that's where you got to leave your hair strong. I found, I, they get a number saying, call here and we'll get you, they'll bring you a new hot water heater. I called the number, I tried to, they say, well, there's grants you can get. But because I'm a retiree, I make just a little bit over the line so I cannot get financial help. So does anybody have any idea where I can help? Because, you know, it ruined, it ruined my pipes. I actually have a bucket underneath the sink, so when I wash my hands, the water goes in the bucket, and I use that bucket to flush the toilet. This is really ridiculous. So what do you do for seniors? We're kind of like a forgotten group. We'll have to make a note of that, because we, we have no idea. I, too, had to replace my hot water tank, you know, and I have seen flyers where they're supposed to come out and replace it if you're eligible, like you say, but you know, if you're not eligible, I don't know. We'll, we'll have to make note of that and see if we can find some information for you, but how thank about, you. How about Habitat for Humanity? Have you tried them? She said, have you tried Habitat for Humanity? They have replaced some of our clients uh, hot water heaters. Okay, yes ma'am. Speak up in the mic, please. Can you? Yes, they, we can't hear you. My name is Barbara Smith, and I'm a resident of Flint. I have received two communications from out-of-state attorneys regarding suing the city of Flint. I've seen on TV that attorneys have come here and held meetings. I have not received any information from any elected officials concerning my right to be a part of a class action suit. So I want to know whose responsibility is it to make sure that I know what my rights are and what options I have regarding this water crisis. Okay. So let me tell you right now, you are represented by the representatives of the class. The lawyers that have sent you information or ads and things of that sort, they're looking for people to sign up with them individually. The class action represents and has filed a case on behalf of everybody that is not personally represented. So you are represented and if we go to trial or if there is a settlement, you will be a part of it. You don't need to do anything. We will be in touch with you. Okay? Okay. Yeah, my name is Russell Moore. Oh, hold on one second, sir. Oh, I know this is <laughs> okay. Hi, I'm Julie Hurwitz, part of this legal team. I have two things I want to say in response to those of you who have come up with your very compelling description of the horrific experiences you've been having with your pipes, your hot water heaters, your, all of the things that have happened to you as a result of this disaster. There is a phone number you can call to our main class action office 
6580020. We are trying to keep track of as much as possible of every one of your horror stories so that we have enough of an understanding of the scope and breadth of the damages that you guys have experienced. So that we factor that in to when it comes time to figure out if there is a viable, reasonable settlement to discuss, we'll have a much better idea. The more information we have from all of you, the more knowledgeable we will be in, in being able to figure out how this is all gonna land. So we need to hear from you. 248-658-0200. Sorry, 0020. And I wanna make one other point. I've been a civil rights lawyer for 30 some years. I'm the last person in the world who's gonna come up here and tell you that the legal system is gonna fix your problems or fix the contradictions or fix the systemic nature of what happened here. This is a political fight, this is a political struggle. So I'm telling you, we are doing everything in our power as lawyers working within an imperfect legal system trying to achieve some semblance of compensation and relief to you for what happened. None of us have been paid off, none of us have been paid, and who knows whether we will ever be paid, but we're here out of our commitment and our dedication to this fight. So. Whatever you think we are gonna be able to accomplish for you through the legal system, put it out of your heads and get into the streets, get into the lobbyists, get to Lansing, get to Washington DC, fight for the change politically that needs to happen. And we will continue trying to achieve some semblance of justice for you through this imperfect legal system. Two, four, eight. Six five eight zero zero two zero. Thank you, thank you. And we do want to take a minute and recognize the class representatives of our case. One is trying to get out of here. I see Rhonda Kelso. Raise your hand, Rhonda. Rhonda is one of your class representatives. I also saw Melissa Mays. I don't know if she's still here. Um, Elnora Carthan was here and she left, but those are some of your class representatives for this class. Yes, sir. Very, very quick, please. Okay, well, I had my hot water here in place. They had me ready to force me because the filter was like four it up. So, the filter is not going to save me anyway because it don't kill bacteria. First of all, I had triple bypass last year. I'm 56 years old, I'm 55 dead. And the hell about what I'm going to over in Saudi Arabia, you know, the death is going. I didn't think I was going to get it on. My point is this. I'm to take my question. I want some of y'all, but I, I am looking for some money because I'm 56. Where do I go up to eat an old person? I don't want, I don't want my number to come up. My yard go up. My car go up because I'm old because of my yard. Well, I'm talking about the money. It's my question. Where's the money? It's your head, bro. Hey, I don't know about the car, but I got no money. You want me to take it? What? You want to see what's different? No, no, no. You're good. You're good. You're good. No, you're good. Check this. I'm not here to read it. All right, real, real quick, sir. Real quick. Where's the money? Where's the money? Where's the money? I mean, before the kids, they were me. I was going to see, I'm in a good, I'm a good star, okay? I said my cousin, my job was a plumber in Lucas yeah. Okay. I'm no lawyer, man. Okay. I don't care about no damn pipes. I don't care about no children, no fault. I do that myself. Okay. I don't know where this is here. But I don't, I, I don't want to start with rumors, I don't want to resist the rumors. I don't want to blame my attorney, because he's the best. Ronald, you know, I know we got you covered. Ronald, you know we got you covered. Okay. Okay. Oh, so, so, 
Oh, is that it? Is we? Okay. Thank you. Real quickly, sir, because we had our Real quick. Hmm? My question is this. Everybody didn't live in Flint that was affected. True. Our community here, I worked here. Okay? Mm -hmm. My question right now is, what does a person do? Uh, I've been an athlete on like play ball every high school last year. Uh, right when all this happened, I had to go into the hospital on emergency. I had a doctor call me, said, call the ambulance after they did my blood test and all that down. Call the ambulance right now or have somebody take Okay. Okay. Went into the hospital, stayed in there for. Okay. What's your question, sir? Okay, my question is, I'm about to go bankrupt with doctor bills. What does a person do at this point right now? For the past three, four, five years, I've been paying thousands of doc doctor bills and deductibles. Uh, my rent's due, car insurance is due. What do I do? Okay. And I live outside of Atlanta. <laughs> Right. You you lived outside of Flint, but you worked in Flint? Yes. Right. Oh. And I have uh, my phone. I can't even ask my phone for bill collection. You are part of the class. Yeah. You will be compensated appropriately. What do I do right now? Nothing until the litigation is over. We're working as hard and as fast what as we can. I all the medical bill collectors that Keep. constantly harassing you. I, you do, I, I, I can't answer that question for you. All I can tell you is to and keep and the I bills. I hope my attorneys don't look so arrogant and down their nose like everybody's stupid and so low light uh, that they don't have time to listen to what I got to say. Uh, I, very arrogant. I, I, I can't. It's respectful. That's all my question. What does the person do right now to... Uh, like, and this is another question I got real quick, is uh, I've been to several doctors in and out of the hospital. Oh, it might be lupus. Oh, it might be this, the immune system. Uh, what doctor is people going through here in Flint that knows how to diagnose this situation? A lot of folks are going to here for the hospital in Detroit. A lot of the clients in here went down there, and they are very familiar. I can't hear you. Wrap it up, Cynthia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Real, real quick, real quick. I said a lot of people have been going down to people for a hospital. The doctors down here are very aware, aware of what's going on, and they are not afraid to make a diagnosis. Yes, that's the best. All right, we want to thank everybody for coming out. We are we have exceeded our time limit. We're going to ask Bishop Jefferson to come and close us out with a word of prayer. We always have to close with a press prayer to seal this. Somebody close to you, grab a hand. Cause the only way we're gonna make this is together. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you for this day. We thank you for what our eyes have seen and our ears have heard. We thank you for those that are working on our behalf. And we thank you that we will work together. Now bless now in the matchless name of the one that we serve. Amen. Amen.